they bite you, they lock the jaw. They look like snakes. No, they don't. <clears throat> Do I even need to explain this shit? A surprise to literally nobody, uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is not a good movie. Is it the worst sequel to end a franchise? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Compared to Jurassic World Dominion, I think it's a better conclusion, but let's face it, that's not saying that much. This movie is essentially a sad excuse to extend a series that should have ended a long time ago, and I think in this case, the box office speaks for itself. It has action scenes that lack Spielberg's directing, a strong woman with no arc or personality, villains who are just there when the plot needs them to be, and Indy himself is reduced to a sad old man who simply has no business being here. And to put it simply, the movie is pointless. It doesn't do any one thing offensively bad, but it also doesn't do anything right. Aside from a few kind of enjoyable scenes, you really just don't care, and by the end, you'd probably just forget the whole thing if not for the franchise it's in and the legacy they destroyed. Luckily, the movie bombed, which is the best thing about this, but given that its reputation was dead before a lot of us even saw it, I'm sure there's people thinking, well, it's not that bad, is it? Well, honestly, I don't know. It's definitely not good, but can it compare to the absolute shit that's ended a lot of other franchises? That's the ultimate question. How bad is the <laughs> Dial of Destiny? Well, the premise is about a bunch of Nazis trying to go back in time using an ancient artifact to change the events of World War II, which is, in my opinion, way worse than Aliens being the main premise. And, like I said, the hatred for that movie has likely been forgotten, and only those who really stand by that film being bad could still say it's the worst movie. And unfortunately, despite knowing this film would suck, it didn't suck in a memorable way like a lot of us thought it would, so let's see how bad it is. This is Indiana Jones and <laughs> Dial of Destiny. Oh, shit. Well, I guess we can't watch the movie, huh? See ya. Uh, uh, I, I mean, it has uh, smoking in it. The, the kids, they might see it and cry. You know, on second thought, that's worse. Hmm, I wonder who the man could be with the bag over his head. Oh, it's Indy, all de-aged and shit. I mean, to be fair, it doesn't look that bad, but it's clear they set this scene at night for a reason. It's currently 1944, in which Indy and his friend Baz, played by Toby Jones, have been captured by Nazis, and Indy is about to be hung. And follow this sweaty little Pied Piper ah! named Adolf. <laughs> Luckily, he has some handy glass on hand to avoid choking, and a handy bomb shows up to blow the place up, killing everybody but him. The point of this intro, like most movies starting out in the past, is mainly to establish something that'll get brought up again later, and a villain who will come back later to obtain whatever that something is. In this case, it's the Archimedes bullshit plot device time traveling dial. And the antagonist, Voller, played by Mads Mikkelsen, is a complete waste of a great actor, as nothing could save the bland role he's given. So, a lot of people have said that this is the best part of the movie, or the only good part of the movie, but to me, it's still not that great. The action scenes are okay, there's some creative ideas thrown in like this, and the comedic moments are pretty good too. But still, none of it's that memorable. Nothing stands out, there's no new ideas at play here, and when the iconic theme starts playing, it just seems like a joke. Granted, this moment is pretty funny. But then, after finding Baz and getting the dial, you have this moment that's kind of stupid when a turret gets taken out, killing a bunch of Nazis who thought it'd be a good idea to hang off the train. And this would be a cool scene if Indy did something to make this happen, but it kind of just happens. Well, the fight he has with the intro villain is pretty good, better than anything we'll get with the main villains, but the ending line is just there. To the victor go the spoils! Okay, I know we don't know this guy, but he is a Nazi, and a sound effect to indicate him hitting the ground would be appreciated. 
However, Voller is there, and he demands that he give him back the dial. So he does, but unfortunately for him, Uncharted 2 wasn't out yet. Leaving you to question how he doesn't die from that, because we know he's not dead. And that's not going to get answered, because he's Mickelson, therefore the main villain, and that's that. We gotta jump! What about my dicky knee? Okay, hold off. We just established that this guy is afraid to balance on the train and can barely fire a gun, but he's okay with jumping off the train like it's nothing. I mean, I know he had no choice, but all of a sudden it's just casual stuff? Luckily, he only gave Voller half the dial. You'd think he'd go and check this supposedly dead body for the other half. But instead, we cut ahead to 1969, and this is just sad. Is this a joke? I'm sorry, but the way he looks in this just doesn't work. It's not believable, it's just stupid, and even though we expected this, it is as bad as we thought it'd be. Also, like every other movie of this nature, his wife Marion is filing for a divorce, because why the fuck not? We'll get back to this a bit later, but for now, we meet our absolutely perfect in every single way, female character Helena Shaw, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. She's Baz's daughter, and Indy's goddaughter, and is supposed to be this charming, strong woman who's smart, funny, and perfect, but the only problem is she's none of that, and isn't even likable. It's the common example of not knowing what to do with the character, so instead, they just tried doing everything and failed all around. However, she's supposed to be real cool, at least that was the plan, so I guess we have to pretend she is. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. It turns out she knows about the dial, everything that happened, and says they should both go and find it. And you, a final triumph! Indiana Jones, out with a bang, back in the saddle! Is that supposed to be a joke? We also see that Voller is not dead, and we meet some more bad guys. An unusually large henchman, and... Oh, fuck no, 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 not the guy from The Predator! Little man, you're serving. He's the one who put those astronauts on the moon. Built the rockets they rode. On the bright side, he plays an asshole, so hopefully he'll have a fun death at least. Right? We also have a field agent who is not a white guy, meaning she'll have to be a lot nicer and probably not even bad. It's gonna make for a great character. It'll just be a few moments. Professor Plimpton? Ma'am? Professor Plimpton? Ma Man, that's all you need to know. That's their development. Their personalities do not go beyond this. Meanwhile, we find out Indy was supposed to destroy his half of the dial as it drove her father insane due to the time-traveling stuff. It's just so much dumber than aliens. And if somebody found the tablet containing directions to the rest of the dial, they could put the two together, meaning there'll be something to find later, but for now... I knew you wouldn't destroy it. How did you know he asked me to destroy it? What? You do remember that night. It appears her intentions are not what they seem. But then the bad guys show up, and we get what is one of the few real good moments in this movie. The scene that I truly love, lightning in a bottle perfection, as you might call it. It didn't get enough awards. I mean, truly underrated stuff. Dr. Jones, we're not gonna hurt you. It's also very important to establish that she is not remotely bad, and clearly only there for a reason that has to be, that doesn't need to be explained. Helena then locks Cindy inside, leaving him to possibly be killed, I hope there's a good reason for that. But he gets away and sees the true extent of what's been done. No, you said eat my pussy. What the fuck is wrong with you? I said you're pushy. You said you're pushy. No, you said eat my pussy. I said sheesh, you're pushy. No, you said eat my pussy. No, that's what he said. I heard it. He said They then frame him as if it's going to affect anything. And he's captured. Uh, briefly, he manages to escape during an anti-war protest, and what follows is kind of a fun scene. Definitely one of the more enjoyable in the movie, especially the subway bit. But it is still kind of lacking, and the idea that a horse would run headfirst into a moving train is kind of stupid. Luckily, something good happens. It's the car! 
Sorry I'm late, Indy. Bridge traffic. It's Salee, again played by John Rice Davies, who tells Indy that Helena is likely going to illegally auction off the dial that she stole because she was arrested for that in the past and bailed out by a mobster. So basically, this strong woman we're supposed to love is okay with her godfather being killed over money. Well, I'm sure there's a good reason, I guess. Because I don't know if they know this, but giving a character a bunch of snappy lines does not make them automatically good if they're real unlikable. And so far, that's kind of what she is. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. But things might not be all bad, as in the next scene, Salee mentions that he not only got Indy stuff, but he also has his passport, meaning... I miss the desert. I miss the sea, and I miss waking up every morning wondering what wonderful adventure the new day will bring to us. This is not an adventure, Sala. What? Give him hell, Indiana Jones! Let me get this straight for a moment. You brought back a classic character, put his dialogue in the trailer, implied that he's going to go with him, and then had him not go with him. I mean, why is he even here? A cameo? If you want to have a cameo, fine, but don't fucking tease us like this. You literally make us think the movie's about to do something right, and then you take that away by having him state that it isn't an adventure, so fuck you. Because really, that's basically what he says. Then again, maybe he's just improvising, because that would be the thought process at this point. We have a flashback showing us that Indy was supposed to destroy the dial, but didn't, because I guess this guy has to do something in this movie. And we move on to the illegal auction. Indy manages to get inside, and yes, in case you're wondering, she did just do this for the money. No reason is ever given, aside from the fact that she's just a thief, but I guess that makes a good character. She thinks I'm a criminal. He's the one wanted for murder. <laughs> trying to put your own godfather in jail. I mean, it's a good thing we don't have any backstory explaining why she might not like him, because if we did, she wouldn't be as cool and memorable. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. The bad guys show up, they fight over it, leading to what I guess is the movie's best scene. It's your basic multiple entities fight over the item of interest with a lot of comedic moments thrown in, and for the most part, it's pretty good. The chase scene is memorable, the inclusion of her ex-lover is a nice touch, and the only complaint that I really hear is that it goes on a bit too long. I don't know if I agree with that, but her method of running is questionable. Man, this moment when she jumps onto the car in an attempt to get the dial back, only to fail, is again just stupid. However, even if you think this scene is too long, there is one moment that's undeniably perfect. <laughs> Even in the absolute worst of movies, there are some scenes that just fit and are undeniably perfect. They escape the ex-lover, but the bad guys get the dial. Luckily, the movie isn't just going to make Helena into an awful person without explaining the reasoning. Maybe there'd been someone there for me, some father figure, someone specifically anointed for the job. Right, I get it. He wasn't there for her. Is that it? Don't beat yourself Trying... up about it. I mean, what even is a godfather? So it's not the reason, you're just an awful person. Well, at least we have this new version of Short Round, who I would complain about as he has no personality, but then again, he's not extremely annoying, so I'll give him a pass. Meanwhile, the other perfect female character has a disagreement with the bad guys, which she is not, and the whole deal they had with the CIA kind of goes south. I didn't mention that earlier because it doesn't matter, but the point is, she dies. Yeah, just dies, and she affected nothing. So why exactly was she in the movie? Was it supposed to be a surprise when she turned on them? Because the fact that she was the only one not shooting the witnesses kind of gave it away. Okay, here's how it's gonna go. You're going to like the video down below, or I'm going to rip out your fucking heart. How's that sound? If you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate you considering subscribing down below, unless you're sick of this movie being complained about. And no, I'm not going to hurt you.
Indie, but conniving bitch, and slightly tolerable short round a team up, because what else? And luckily she memorized her father's notebook because she's perfect, so they can find the Graficos. He tracks down his friend Ronaldo, the diving expert, played by Antonio Banderas, because I guess he likes appearing in shitty treasure hunting movies. And we have something that I guess isn't as bad as it could have been. What if you could go back in time? What would you do? I'd stop my son from enlisting. I told him he was gonna die. Yeah, the fact that his son's death leading to their divorce isn't just something they did for the sake of doing it is a slight positive. That being said, it's still relatively pointless as it's never implied to be his motivations again. I mean, it could be the reason he didn't destroy it, but they never go into any detail on that. It's too bad because if they did, it would have made the movie somewhat unique. You're still wearing the ring. That was supposed to get a reaction. Am I not as witty as I thought? They let us know dynamite might be a thing later, and they head to the sunken ship to find the Graficos. They easily do so while fighting off some eels. I'm genuinely surprised they remembered Indy's fear of snakes because they're kind of like snakes. And if you saw this in the theater, it's probably the last thing you won't forget on the ride home. I mean, you'll forget the next day most likely, but at least you wouldn't have fallen asleep. Because from this point on, it's mainly a snooze fest. Helena does go back to help Indy because it's been more than half the movie. We have to have the illusion of decency. But then the bad guys show up, cutting one of the airlines, killing somebody we don't know. The rest of them make it out, but the movie now has no use for Antonio, and he's killed off when Indy refuses to read it. Damn, you really gotta love these villains. Uh, killing people like it's nothing, uh, cool lines like this. Things move forward, Dr. Jones. And sometimes, they go backward. It's just beyond engaging. However, Helena says she'll read it for money, and even though I have no issue believing she'd do that, the final act is approaching, so unless she's going to become a villain, which I would personally love, she's supposed to be perfect, and that's not gonna happen, so... Gold star for Dr. Brains! The dynamite from the previous scene, which doesn't kill anybody important, but they escape, and apparently she did not give them all the right information. But Archimedes didn't make it that easy. The tomb isn't in Alexandria. However, if only they knew where to go, you wouldn't have much of a movie left, would you? So they had to find a clever way to get around this, and I just can't believe what they came up with. They're gonna watch them with binoculars and see where they go. <laughs> the innovation is unreal. Then after the, at this point, insulting map sequence, we have something that goes against this movie's important message. I'm still in charge, Teddy. Helena, get over here, give me a hand. Short Round 2.0 just walks off because he's upset about Indy being there or he wants ice cream, I don't fucking know. But he gets kidnapped so he can slightly affect his scene later and it's... I don't know. They were gonna go to the cavern anyway, they just go a bit faster now, but at least we have this scene. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba -ba -ba. It's hinted at that they need the kid, but he doesn't do anything, and after losing him, they don't really care. He does manage to give us the only unique death in the movie, because he's smart, I suppose. But it is funny that he's the only character to pull this off. It's also funny that he knows how to swim, as they had previously established he can't swim. I guess logic is for losers. Then, after a scene with some bugs, because his movie has to have that, and a puzzle room, because it has to have that too, they finally find the other half of the dial. The bad guys show up, but the short round kid finally does something justifying him getting caught in the previous scene. I guess this is a good reason to play the theme, which got me copyrighted last time, so I'm not gonna play it here, but believe me, it's pretty forced. Indy gets shot by a bullet that only affects him when the plot needs it to, and you might be wondering, why don't they just kill him opposed to taking him with them? 
And believe it or not, if they had just killed him and went about their plans, it wouldn't have affected a fucking thing as far as their plans go. You'll see what I mean in a few minutes. The others pursue them on a bike, and we finally find out what the plan actually is. Who are we gonna kill to win the war? Wow, I don't fucking believe it. The Nazis' plan the whole time was to go back into time and help Germany win the war. Who would have seen this coming? They planned to do this by killing Hitler and taking his place, but the amazing strong woman and short round two have a plan. I think you can fly one of those. A Nord? Well, I haven't flown a Nord. You've never flown any plane. I'll get it started. <laughs> okay, let's review what we just saw. She asks him if he can fly that plane, in which she says yes, and then says he's never flown that kind of plane. She responds by saying you've never flown any kind of plane, begging the question why she asked him to fly a plane, and then he says he'll just get it started, she says no, and I guess assumes it'll be fine. What the hell? She then pursues their plane on a bike, and due to the continental drift, which wasn't known about back then, he tells them they're gonna end up in the wrong time period, but they don't listen because they're bad. But I'll admit, the spectacle here is kind of nice, and it's funny how random guys in the kid's plane. But as you'd guess, it's not 1939, it's the Siege of Syracuse in 214 BC. So, in theory, this would be a neat idea for a climax, but the problem is, nobody really does anything. Yeah, Helena disposes of a few men, but then they just take the only parachute and leave. Aside from that, the plane just flies around for a bit until inevitably crashing, and that's the end of the bad guys. Not only is that a boring death, but why even have a secondary villain? I waited the whole movie to see what this guy's unique death would be, and it's not even unique. What a fucking letdown that was. However, there's a twist you definitely didn't see coming. I'm going to stay. No, you're not serious. Okay, in an attempt to explain what happens next, uh, he wants to stay in the past and die. Helena doesn't want him to because it might and likely will affect the present, but also because she cares about him now despite almost getting him killed. Archimedes, after obtaining the dial from the plane crash, explains that he built it to bring people from the future to help, I guess. But it only brings people there, and it's implied that Indy might do something to help even though he's dying. I have no fucking idea what that might be, but none of it matters anyway because... Me too. She knocks him out, and they go back home, making the entire conversation irrelevant, so why didn't it even exist? Why did we get all that shit with our comedies, all that shit about Indy wanting to stay there so he could be brought back by force? What was the fucking point? I knew the ending would suck, but I don't think anybody thought this through. It's never been hinted at that he'd want to live there, there's nothing to do with a possible motivation to save his son, and given that it would likely fuck up history, I have no choice but to say in this case, Helena's right. And considering what we've sat through, that's saying something. But given that Indy's not going to die, something that many of us speculated he would, there's gotta be some reason for it, a memorable final scene at least. Well, his wife comes back, again played by Karen Allen, so in a forced scene, and... The perfect ending. Literally the most fitting ending. The ending that I envisioned this movie having since day one. And it definitely suits it. So yeah, aside from a couple of watchable scenes, nothing really good to say about the Dial of Destiny. Given that it failed on arrival, I don't think any of the flaws here haven't been said a dozen times by now. 
His age is beyond pathetic, the action scenes, despite some being decent, lack the previous film's directing, and the plot is beyond stupid and full of holes. Similar to The Crystal Skull, I didn't mind the out-of-place sci-fi elements that much, as they didn't affect the whole movie and were really just a means to an end. This time is taken a bit further, giving us a beyond appalling climax, but that's not the biggest issue here. It's more so about the lazy writing and the fact that most of the characters outright suck. This includes Indy himself not being remotely likable and a shell of what he once was, but the worst character in the movie is definitely Helena, who is not only okay with screwing over his godfather for money, but is also a poor attempt to construct a strong woman without putting any thought into it. She has no good qualities, no arc to speak of aside from not being as selfish by the end, and is, dare I say, less likable than Willy from Temple of Doom, and again, that's saying something. The villains are no better, not that this franchise is known for great villains, but in this case, they didn't even try. But in the end, the biggest issue with this film is that it feels like something that had no business being made. Indy doesn't even do that much, the villains basically kill themselves. I know I said at the beginning it's not the worst conclusion to a franchise out there, and it isn't, you could get some enjoyment out of it if you just don't care, but that doesn't mean it isn't greatly insulting. The only good news is that unless they revisit that old E.T. sequel, there isn't a whole lot left to destroy. As predicted, the fourth movie is now irrelevant, and Dr. Jones can join Star Wars on Disney's Hall of Shame. I'm The Analyst, and remember kids, even if you don't know what a godfather is, they probably mean something to your father, so... Show some respect. So, you've made it to the end. That's an impressive feat indeed. Since you managed that, I guess check out the gaming channel, in which I cover a variety of gaming topics, like analysis videos such as this one. If you're into that, then press the link in the description. It's that simple.